register and vote uh, early on, but, but obviously uh, that changed. And I've always been interested in uh, why that change took place. What, what about it went from somebody who didn't even bother to register to vote to being such an activist uh, after he was an adult, because he was in his, I think he was even, it may have been his 30s before he participated in all in politics. Anyway. Well, that's very interesting. I was probably in my 30s when I did this. My goodness. <laughs> well, um, with this great historian here, I'm making me nervous. <laughs> um, well, let me say, I, I uh, briefly, I, I uh, was born in Baltimore, went to Bell family, and moved to Baltimore from Alabama. And uh, before I was a year old, my family returned back to the South. And, uh, I, that's why, that's basically my home now. But uh, I left Alabama my last year of high school and moved to the West Coast. And that's a long story of the fact I would say it was God's hand that moved me on as I needed to leave to clear my head. But I would say that as a young man, I was, uh, I didn't see the point of racism, hate, bigotry. I was always, my thing with my mother, I questioned everything. Still that way today, I question everything. And someone said that's good because you don't ask questions, you won't get answers. So um, uh, the Robeson story, I knew very little of Robeson. Uh, I first heard him, I was about 13 years old, I suppose, maybe 12. But my favorite thing to do was to listen to classical, this classical music station. I was the only one in my house that did that. My dad just come in and say, uh, what's that you listening to? I said, they called it classical music. And uh, late one night, they would let me keep my radio on all night. I would turn it low by my pillow. And uh, that was my first encounter with Rolston. He was singing Deep River. And I remember hearing, Deep River, I said, oh my God. <laughs> I mean, it reminded me of the extreme voice of Prano at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said, oh my. God, if I could sing like that. But as uh, he went on to sing the song, Good Night, I said, Man, it just took me place, my mind place. I still had peace about everything. And the next morning, I asked, I asked my father, I said, who's Paul Robeson? And he said, oh, he, he's a communist. And I said, uh, what's a communist? He said, I don't know, son, but they say they're not good people. And I never bought that because of what he molded through his song. And as an artist myself, I believe whatever's inside eventually comes out. <laughs> so. I just, so I, that was the end of it for Ropes and other I loved listening to him until I got involved in opera. But uh, I, in traveling in Europe, I met many Russians who would tell me, you know, you sound like Paul Ropes. Uh, you even kind of have a demeanor like him on stage. And I was like, really? So I was too busy to, to really dive into his story. Um, uh, I, started my career in opera on the West Coast. I actually, there have been so many points in my life where as a human being, I, I, I've just been disappointed with humanity. Uh, I used to ask my mom why, why she didn't like that. She said, well, I don't know, son. Uh, she said, I, they don't like our skin color. I said, but why? They, they drive black cars and they seem love and they shine them up pretty good. And spend a lot of money on them. I said, it's a color thing. They, we should be worth a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> through the opera because uh, I learned that racism is not a skin color. It's, it's, it's a condition of the human spirit. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that uh, I, was, I was doing a Q&A in LA where I did my show and a lady from England said to me, she said, you know, um, in England we didn't have that problem with racism. Mm -hmm. And I stared at her and I said, you know, it's all about semantics. We use semantics to glorify, to, de to demonize whatever we like. And I said, really, let's talk about oppression. Racism is another brand of oppression. And I said, so your, company, your country did practice oppression. I said, Every, all around the world, we use excuses to oppress one another. And I said, no, let's step away the semantics. That's, you should never treat someone like you would not want to be treated. You should never allow someone to be treated like you would be treated. And that is the sum of it for me. That determines a good person from a bad person to me. And I said, uh, the rest, I'll leave to God. But uh, 
anyways, uh, Robeson, um, I started the show to promote a screenplay that I wrote with a partner uh, on Robeson and uh, had no uh, idea what the uh, show would get this far. And uh, so um, when the lady that I studied with, she was uh, raised in England, Polish descent, and her mother was a prisoner in the Gulags during Stalin's era. And she, she hated Rosen. She didn't like him because <laughs> they called him a Stalinist. And her mother went through some very hard things. And uh, anyways, but she, it was good writing with her the screenplay because I wrote the, I could see right away that uh, mm -hmm. I needed to write the story to address, not to address the people that loved Rosen, but the people that had a problem with who he was. And uh, she said, you know, how can you even want us to do this story about a man? And I said, you need to take, take a walk in his shoes to look through his window at life. So before the research was over, she fell in love with Rose. And then she turned to me and said, well, um, how come you don't hate white people? And I said, well, if hate would solve the problem, I would hate well. I said, but hate only destroys the hater. And uh, it's not, it's, it does not solve the problem. Love does. Forgiveness does. And uh, I personally, I, I'm not trying to be religious. I think the problem with humanity lies quite in a, in a dimension above us. And uh, I think the battle, we're battling something yet unknown among humans. Because I remember when I was a child, I used to look at white people and say, they seem to be fine people. They're so nice. What's the problem? <laughs> they love Jesus. I said, well, you know, I, I didn't understand. So I had no room for hate, really. I was disappointed. So long story short, when I won the Met competition on the West Coast, went into a extensive operating career for 20 years. and. Uh, I moved from America to Germany, where I lived for two years, and there I saw a part of the media that we don't see here. I happened to go there right after the 9-11, uh, uh, the start of the Iraqi war, and the human atrocities, the civilian atrocities that I saw, uh, the bodies of children's legs, black as this floor, burnt from the bombs. And I said, as Americans, I'm not seeing this side of the war. And it, it disturbed me greatly. And, uh, Someone said to me, well, you shouldn't be concerned about that. You know, you got a great career and you have a wonderful voice, you can do anything. And I said, well, hopefully one day I live in a world where I can labor for mansions and homes and things and find things. But in a world like this, I felt figured the best thing to do, whatever talent you have, is make a difference in it for the best. So uh, the Paul Rosen story, after I researched it for over a year and a half, and I'm still researching, I'm still learning about it. It's an amazing story. I saw it. First of all, I was looking for a catalyst to get attention in the public arena, not knowing how important the story was. But after studying about Paul, my focus changed from a, as a catalyst to a way of uh, getting what was inside me out. And uh, the, I, there are many Paul Rosen stories going around the country. Uh, James L. Jones did one. Uh, uh, Avery, I mean, Avery Fish did the same one. There's several going on. But, uh, I saw them, and they were great stories, and James L. Jones was a great actor. Uh, and, uh, but Paul Rosen's story, many stories uh, I saw of him, he came across as an angry man with a cause. But he was more than that. I don't think he was just an angry man, or he was angry at all. I think, <laughs> I felt like me, he was disappointed at humanity. And uh, so I wanted to, I say the story is very difficult to tell without his song and the energy he molded through his songs. And I think that's what's always been missing. Uh, we, in my Iraq world, Pentecostal, we call it the anointing. Mm -hmm. In college, we call it ethos. Mm -hmm. And around the world, we call it many things. But I, the source that put us here reaches out through art to make change. And I quote Paul Robeson, an artist must elect to fight for freedom or for slavery. And I have made my choice. I had no alternative. So uh, his story helped me to say something I wanted to say and someone said to me, you know, uh, what did you want to say? And uh, I said, I want to say to everybody, what the hell is this? Uh, what, what are we living down here? It is my belief, after we've asked Paul, that I used to blame demons and God for, not be, for being slow to answer for a human problem, but I believe Christ was right when he said the kingdom of God is in us, and uh, we are painting this picture down here, and uh, I believe that when humanity comes to solidarity for peace and social justice, we will see a major
amazing world. And someone said to me, uh, uh, do you think we're capable? I said, I think the fact that we are, that I think the fact that we are capable is, is the reason something is so busy keeping us divided. I think we are well capable and something knows it. And uh, you think about it, we are divided culturally, uh, economically, religiously. I'm an A student, I'm a B student, I'm a D student. Now, I, I grew up in the projects in, in Alabama, and uh, I went back there when I came down to do the Rolton show, and I went to the house where I grew up, and I went and knocked on the door. <laughs> but the people weren't home, and a gentleman pulled up in a car, and he was staring at me. And I could see he was kind of nervous. He probably thought it was the FBI or what, but I walked up to him, and I said, hello. And he's like, who are you? And I said, my name is K.B. Solomon, stage name, but I was legal name was Kevin Bell, and I said, I grew up in that house right there, and he looked at me. He said, you did? He said, how old are you? I told him how old I was, and he said, wow, I'm 20 years younger, and I look older than you. And I said, you know, sometimes life is hard, I'm all in a lot of different ways. But anyways, he said, why you come back? I said, because I remember running barefooted through these fields and walking to school, and I said, there are diamonds out here in this rough. And I said, there are all around the world, I believe God has put gifts and talents to help humanity on its way. But when we, we practice inequality, we lose out as a whole because the answer to, to cancer is out there somewhere. I said, I came from this place and I told him what I had accomplished. He said, well, why would you come back here? I said, to make a statement that we must take care of our, of our fellow man because when we don't, we end up shooting our own selves in the foot. And I said, society is melting along in so many ways because we don't understand we belong together. And I, I had the privilege of taking Paul's story to the science community at USC, where they've been studying the effects of sound on the water molecules. And by the way, the military uses sound for a weapon. By the way, they have a weapon they can point at you and disrupt your water molecules and kill you. Now, music actually also interferes with your water molecules. When you get the goosebumps and the feeling through it on a microscope, what's happening? your water molecules are changing shape, that's what you're feeling. So I went into the lab, and I saw them for the science, they were, I forget the, what their titles were, but they started getting goosebumps. And I said, I just reshaped every water molecule in your body. And the scientists went, hmm. <laughs> it was like, hmm. <laughs> so, so for this reason, I believe that art is a, as Paul said, art is a weapon for peace, to get people to come back together to feel it. Walls that cultures erect in front of our spirits. And uh, I hope I'm not running too far from Paul, but I believe that Paul was onto this as well. And, and whatever you do in life, uh, and I live in, in LA, and someone in Hollywood said to me, You know, with a talent like that, I would be doing this and doing this. And I said, In another place where there's peace and equality, I would. But I said, How can you build a mansion when the wood that you want to build from is the forest is on fire? I said, the forest is on fire all around the world. And we need to put the fire out first before we begin to feel and think of that kind of thing. So I like Paul. I believe Paul, I was, uh, well, I was uh, doing a telephone, telephone interview in BBC where I was surprised to learn that they have a Black History Month there. And we were discussing Paul, and she said, okay, tell us. And uh, she said, you got one, one minute and a half. Tell us, why should we remember Paul? And I said, she said, what did you do so great that we should remember him? I said, in one and a half minutes, you want me to ask? I said, okay. I said, Paul exemplified the state of mind and character. If a 16th of one city had, we would change the world for the better. And that is that he refused to let personal success explain away injustice. And that he cared about his fellow man enough to make the ultimate sacrifice. And he stood alone to bear a heavy burden. And uh, I said, if a few of us had that same ideology, we changed the world forever. And I, as she said, I said, for that, his story should be studied and be an example of how we should live. And I don't view Paul as a perfect man, but perfection is, in this finite state, I don't think it's achievable. But, um, but definitely, um, one of the most uh, inspiring uh, things that happened on the show was a lady came up to me and said, uh, my daughter had dropped out of school. She's drugging out and hanging out. And she was an A student that just quit. And 
she said, a brother to this show, she knew nothing about Paul Robeson. And she was in her early 20s. And she said, I want to tell you something. She said to me, Mom, I'm going back to school because I realized that one person can make a difference. She said, I didn't know that was a problem. But she had given up. But she wanted to see a better world. And she felt like being educated in this world was the point. Because some of us really do care. We really do want a better world. I think most of us are that way. So, as Einstein said, I believe it was Einstein, correct me if I'm wrong, the world is a dangerous place, not because of those who do evil, but because of those who look on and do nothing. And that has been the problem, and I think Paul knew that. So, those that you said, the <laughs> premature antipassion. <laughs> but, uh, still remains today. 
USC as artist in residence in the School of Religious Life. And uh, I go share my faith. God is a great God. And, uh, uh, we only, there's so many known unknowns and unknown unknowns in this life and who we are. I said to one guy, where did we come from? Who did we come from? And where do we go from here? And we really don't know. But life is like a big puzzle. It has a much bigger picture, picture than any of us. He has many pieces, quite a bit more than me. I only have one. He has uh, many, many, many. But each of you have a piece to this puzzle down here. And when we come together in solidarity, we see the much bigger picture that God has meant for us to see. And I believe that God has sort of scattered truth among all of us so that the only way we would see it is as Christ said, I pray that you be one. As me as my father are one. And I think that is much deeper than the English language and the translations have lended us. And uh, so that's what I'm about. And uh, I, as the old Negro spiritual says, I want to die easy when I die. I want to die remembering that I was a, had a purpose of good, of good. I walked into a, a shop in LA owned by an Indian fellow whom I did not know. And he looks at me and says, you have a, a great karma. I said, a good karma, my friend. I went on the internet and looked up karma. <laughs> <laughs> and there are many purposes among God's creations. And, uh, I believe there are some people that just have an evil purpose, and I don't hate them, but I have a good purpose, and my, my purpose is to stand against a bad purpose. And I've noticed that even in my bad decisions, God has turned around for my good. And uh, so I'm honored to do this story about this great man, this great icon. And I believe that Paul uh, was a good person because it takes a good person to turn down economic gain, to take a stand for human for equality among us all. So I, and what amazed me was his white support. I mean, it just wouldn't have happened in that era without his white brothers helping him. And this story has helped many black people in the inner cities to heal concerning the misunderstanding that our white brothers were against us. But it's amazing even today how the media is, manipulates our way of thinking. And I think they're on to what Christ knew as a man thinking so is it. So I'm out to change the way people think through art about each other, about how we should live down here. And I'm just shocked that in my time, 2014, that my country is still at war over economic gain. And I'm not a nationalist. I believe that God's got the whole world in his hand because this is his world. Every soul is his soul. And uh, I believe, I, I tell you, I was in, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm very talkative about it. <laughs>